Welcome, friends, to a special Sabbath enrichment seminar, a seminar which is designed to enrich our understanding and the experience of God's holy day, the day which God has given us to draw closer to him and closer to one another. Let us pray that the Lord may guide us in this very important meditation. May God give us a spirit and his presence in this Bible study. Thank you, God, for the opportunity and the privilege granted us to study afresh how on and through thy holy Sabbath day we can stop our work to allow thee to work in us more fully and more freely. Bless us with thy presence, bless us with thy spirit, and may this Bible study help us to appreciate and experience more fully the blessing of thy holy Sabbath day. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. I like you to bring you greetings from my family. It is often said that behind the, every successful man there is a dedicated wife. I like to propose that perhaps there is also a supportive family. And this picture that you see was taken uh, in commemoration of our 42nd wedding anniversary. And there you can see all my family members my two sons, the daughter-in-laws, and my daughter, and my uh, committed and dedicated wife, and I owe much to them for allowing me to fulfill this itinerant ministry around the world. By way of introduction, we may wish to ask, why do we need the Sabbath enrichment seminar? Some of us have observed the Sabbath for many years. May I propose you two reasons. Number one, to enrich our understanding and the experience of the Sabbath. Some people have an accepted the Sabbath, have accepted the validity of the Sabbath, but they are not necessarily experiencing the benefit, the joy of the Sabbath. They view the Sabbath more as a commandment, an obligation, something they have to observe in order to be saved, but they are not experiencing the benefits of the Sabbath. And I believe that if ever there was a time when we needed the benefits, the blessing of the Sabbath, such time is today when many live intensively active, rushing, restless lifestyle. You know, according to Time magazine, the best-selling drugs in America today, they are all tension, stress-related drugs. In order to overcome their tension and stress, people take pills, drugs, alcohol, vacation to a fantasy island, hoping to forget it all, hoping to regain the balance, the equilibrium of their being. But experience tells us that inner peace and rest is to be found not through pills, not through places, but in the right relationship with the person, the person of our Savior who says, come unto me and I will give you rest. And may I propose that this is indeed the main objective, the goal of this seminar, to help us explore how on and through the Sabbath we can invite our Savior to bring rest, release, renewal to our life. The second reason why we need the Sabbath Enrichment Seminar is to equip us to proclaim and defend the Sabbath more fully. We are reminded that in this final hour of world history, the Sabbath is to be proclaimed more fully. In order to proclaim the Sabbath more fully, we need to understand it more fully. We need to experience it more fully. And I hope that this Sabbath seminar will help us to that, toward that objective, to understand and experience the Sabbath more fully. We also need to equip ourselves to defend the Sabbath more fully. Today, the Sabbath is being attacked more than ever before, from the Pope himself, who in a subtle and deceptive way wants to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath, is attacked by Catholic and Protestant scholars who are attempting to legitimize Sunday as a biblical institution, is attacked by former Sabbatarian. Some of those who were the champion of Sabbath keeping in the past today, they are becoming some of the most bitter enemies, is also being attacked by our materialistic culture. There are more and more Sabbatarian who are adopting the Sunday hippie mentality. When the church service is over, they go home, take off the Sabbath clothes, and put them in the closet, close the closet, close the Sabbath. Well, that indeed is Sunday keeping, not Sabbath keeping, because the essence of Sabbath keeping is not just going to church, but giving priority to God in our thinking and in our living. I'd like to take a few moments to give you an overview of this uh, Sabbath enrichment seminar. I'd like to start by sharing with you the story of the Sabbath in my own life. This is the gripping story 
of my search for the Sabbath at the Vatican University, of how the Lord opened the door for me to aim to study, research, and even publish the Sabbath of all places inside the most prestigious Jesuit University in the world, the Pontifical Gregorian University. I also like to share with you how the Lord led me to libraries and archives to find very revealing documents showing how the change came about from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. In the second meditation, we want to explore together how on and through the Sabbath we can serve God, ourselves, and others. This is one of my favorite Sabbath meditations because it's very practical. We are going to articulate basic biblical principles for keeping the Sabbath in a way that it will bring us blessing and enjoyment to our lives. The third lecture is entitled The Sabbath and the Savior. This is a Bible study which will help us understand seven ways in which the Sabbath enabled the Savior to bring peace and presence and renewal to our life. Then the fourth presentation of the Sabbath and the crossfire, this is the longest one, the last two hours. We divide it in, in two sessions. The first one hour will deal with the latest attacks against the Sabbath, and you will be interested to learn how the Sabbath is being attacked today more than ever before, not only by the Pope, by, by, uh, by Catholic and Protestant scholars, by former Sabbatarian, and you will see what is happening today. But the second part of the lecture, the second hour of the lecture, uh, will be very encouraging report on the rediscovery of the Sabbath by scholars, church leaders, and religious organizations. And I believe you will find this lecture very, very informative. Then in the final lecture on the Sabbath, um, this is the fifth and final lecture, from Sabbath to Sunday, how it came about. In this lecture, I'd like to share with you the highlight of the discovery that I made in Vatican libraries in Rome, where I searched investigated the subject for five years, and I found very revealing documents. Documents showing the theological, social, liturgical methods used by bishops of Rome, by the papacy, to lead people away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. This is a lecture you, you will enjoy. Those of you that appreciate history, that like to have an inquiring mind, I believe you will find this very, very informative. So I want to welcome all of you to attend all of this lecture, and uh, be sure if you find them very helpful, very informative, inspiring, uh, be sure to invite your friends as well. Now, my testimony, the story of the search of the Sabbath at the Vatican University in Rome. I was born a stone throw from the Vatican wall. You notice here the entrance to the Vatican Museum, Musei Vaticani. Would you believe it? I was born across the street, just a stone throw from the Vatican wall. And that is where I lived the first 18 years of my life. On my way to school, I remember crossing St. Peter's Square. And many times when I had some time on my hand, I loved to go inside that beautiful basilica. One of the things I admired to look at was what we call the throne of St. Peter with this very impressive sunburst. And next to the throne of St. Peter, there is the actual statue of St. Peter. By the way, this is a very interesting statue. Originally, it was a pagan statue. Did you know that? It was the statue of Jupiter, the father of all the pagan gods. And what the Catholic Church did, they put a crown on his head, a bunch of keys on his hand, and out of a pagan statue, out of Jupiter, they made Peter, who for them is the founder of the Catholic Church. And you will always see devout people queuing up to kiss the toes of the statue. And they have done so much kissing that the toes have been worn out, and often I wonder how many germs have circulated around the world from the kissing of the toes of St. Peter. Don't you think so? Now, here is the main altar where the Pope celebrates the Mass on, on special occasion. My father and my mother were very devout Catholic, particularly my dad. He attended Sunday Mass regularly. My mom and dad recited the Rosary, Il Rosario, every night. They live what you and I would call a very pious, religious, Catholic life. 
And that was true for my dad until the age of 21. At that time, he met a Waldensian who gave him a Bible. Now, you must have heard of the Waldensians. You know, there is a very old evangelical church that throughout the Middle Ages played a very important role in translating, distributing the Bible. And, you know, their headquarter, their mother church is up in a place called Torre Pellice, which is very close to Turin. And if you were to visit the church, one more thing you would notice as you go inside the church, they display very prominently the Bible in front and on the top of the pulpit to indicate their mission as a church to promote the translation, circulation of the Word of God. And because of their commitment to distribute Bibles, they were severely persecuted. During the Middle Ages, many of these dear people had to flee there up in the Waldensian Valley, you know, in the Piedmont Valley, build some rustic homes. And it was on those rustic mountain homes that they translated and copied portion of, portion of the Word of God. And what did they do? Most of them were merchants of cloth. So they put those portions of the Word of God in the bottom of their sack where they carried their merchandise, their textile, and their sack they carried across the neck. And uh, this is where we get the word colporter. That is the word we, we used to use for literature evangelists. What does colporter mean? It's collo, neck, Porter, portar, neck carrier. So these world, world dancers were neck carrier. They carried their merchandise, uh, you know, ac across their shoulder. And then when they visited the home and saw that the lady or the gentleman were receptive to the gospel, they would pull out from the bottom of their sack a portion of the word of God and leave it in the home for them to read for two, three weeks. And then they would go back to pick it up because it was a very expensive project. Because of their commitment to distribute the Word of God, they were severely persecuted. Would you believe it? In 1655, the Catholic Duke of Savoy, at the instruction of the Pope, organized a crusade against the Waldenses, and he massacred over 50,000 of them. And many of these massacred people were dumped from this cliff. They would kill them and then dump them down into the valley. That's why the place is called Castaluzzo, that is the place of casting down, where innocent people who only had the desire to share the word of God were murdered and massacred and dumped into the valley. The great English poet John Milton uh, captured the, the, the shock of the Protestant world in his sonnet on Paradise Lost, where he says, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughter saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our father worship stock and stones. My father joined the World Ancient Church in Rome for two years. It's a beautiful church, by the way. Next to the church, there is their theological seminary. And would you believe it? Every Wednesday night, they had the theology students who laid out in a Bible study. And one particular Wednesday night, a theology student gave a Bible study on the Sabbath. And my father heard reading from Genesis chapter 2, 2, and 3. I'm sure that you are very familiar with the text where he said, On the seventh day, God finished the work which he had done, and he rested from all the work which he had done, and he blessed the seventh day, and hallowed the seventh day because all the work which he had done. He went home and read and reread this text, and, you know, he asked himself, if God finished the work on the seventh day, if he rested on the seventh day, if he blessed the seventh day, if he hallowed the seventh day, what am I doing on the first day? And then what did he do? He went through the city of Rome looking for a seventh day Sabbath keeping church. And he asked a number of Catholic priests and Protestant pastors if they knew of a church that observed the seventh day Sabbath according to the scripture. But my dad was told there was no seventh day Sabbath keeping church because seventh day Sabbath keeping is Jewish. It was nailed to the cross. It's no longer practiced by Christians today. Well, my mom and dad, they felt that if it's in the Bible, it must be true. And when they could not locate a seven-day Sabbath keep in church, you know what they did? By themselves, my mom, my dad, I was only a small baby at the time, decided to honor the Lord on the Sabbath by themselves in their own home. And they thought 
that they were the only seven-day Sabbath keeper on the face of the earth, living under the shadow of the Vatican. <laughs> what do you say to that? And you know what happened? About a year later, my mom got an invitation to attend the Bible study, and uh, my father went along out of curiosity, and the gentleman living out in the Bible study was an Adventist preacher, Pastor Silo Agnello, who passed away a few years ago. This was the first time that my mom and dad came in contact with our church, which in those days consisted only of six members who met in a private home. We did not have a church building. We only had a nucleus of believers. Today, it's a different ball game. When I was back in Rome last summer, mamma mia, we have 10 churches. Not only Italian churches, we have a nice Filipino church. I think our Filipino friends here will appreciate that. We almost have 200 Filipinos there in the, in, in the city of Rome. We have a Spanish church, a Romanian church. We have all sorts of churches, not only Italian, but also foreign churches right in the city of Rome. Honoring the Savior on the Sabbath became a testing truth for my, ma for my dad and for the whole family. My father was working building construction as a, as a carpenter. And when he asked for the Sabbath free, he was fired. For six months, he was unemployed. He went out day after day from building site to building site, looking for a job. There was plenty of work. Right after the Second World War, there was all sorts of rebuilding going on because of all the bombing of the Nazis. But whenever he asked for the Sabbath free, he would be shown the door. After six months, our family was starving. My dad told us the story many times of the morning when mom and dad became aware of the fact that there was no money, no food, we were starving. And in desperation, they prayed to the Lord. It was a prayer of desperation, Lord, to be faithful to thee. Our family is starving. As I'm going out today, as I have done for the past six months, oh Lord, please touch the heart of a prospective employer that may be giving me a job. And after the prayer of desperation, my father went out. And uh, he went to a building site where he had not been before. And uh, he approached the builder and asked him if he could use him. And he explained his experience, the places where he had worked. And without a moment of hesitation, the builder told my dad, you can change and get started right away. But my father hastened to explain that he would not be able to work on Saturday because Saturday is his holy day in which he wanted to honor the Savior. Now the builder became sarcastic. Did you come looking for a job or for vacation? If you are not interested to work, why don't you get out of this place? My father was a big man, bigger than me. You know what? He broke down in tears. He said, sir, I did not come. Looking for vacation. Our family is starving. For the last six months, everybody has treated me like you. We have no food and no money. I plead with you to give me the chance. All what I want to do is to honor the Savior on the Sabbath. I'm prepared to work on Sunday, to work at night, to give up vacation time. I'll do anything that it takes to prove myself. Give me a chance. You know what? That builder was touched to see a big man like my dad crying for wanting to honor the Savior on the Sabbath in a country like Italy where 95% of the Catholics only go to church three times in their life when they are hatched, matched, dispatched. You know what that means? <laughs> when they are baptized, married, and buried. Those are the three trips they make to church. And here was my dad crying for wanting to honor the Savior every week on the Sabbath. But somehow that builder was touched. And you know what he told my dad? Well, why don't you change and get started? And let's see what is going to happen. You know what happened? For the next 50 years, my father never lost a day of work in the city of Rome. Apparently, the Lord was testing his faith. Isn't it true? And when he proved to be faithful, obviously, he was rewarded. The Sabbath became a testing truth in my own youth. I grew up in Rome at a time when Saturday was a school day. And I remember that some of the Adventist family did not want to go through the trouble of having to justify the absences of having the children expelled from school. And so many of the families sent their children to school on Saturday. But my parents were determined 
that we will be faithful to God in honoring his holy Sabbath day. And you know what I remember? I remember the principal of the secondary school in Piazza Mazzini, that is the name of the square where the school was located, who would tell my wife, my, not my wife, my mom, that if I would be absent for three consecutive Saturdays without medical excuse, I would be expelled. And you know what my mommy did? <laughs> she took me to the family doctor <laughs> every week. And the doctor was very helpful. He wrote a very funny medical excuse saying that Samuel Bacchiocchi on such and such a Saturday was psychologicamente incapacitato. What does it mean? <laughs> Psychological incapacitated. My mind was working fine during the week, but when Saturday came, it, my brain snapped out. It went out of order. And the principal accepted it because it had been prepared by a doctor. It was an official medical excuse. I also remember the problem I had with a Catholic priest that came twice a week, right there in the public school. They still do it today, by the way to teach us il catechismo cattolico, the Catholic catechism. When he heard that I was not a Catholic, protestante, protestante adventista, adventist protestant, which in his mind was the worst possible breed of protestantism. You know what he did? He told the class, Sam Bacchiocchi sitting down there is a protestant heretical, heretical protestant. Keep away from him. Keep away from him. You know why I remember it? Whenever I try to, try to approach my friends to strike conversation with them, they would say, stay lontano, keep away from us, keep away from us. Tu sei un eretico, you are a heretic. Tu sei un judeo, you are a Jew. They did not want to talk with me. When you are a teenager, you want to be accepted by your friends. Isn't it true? I was heartbroken. Many times I went home crying Mom, Papa, don't send me to school anymore. Everybody hates me at school. I don't want to go to school anymore. I remember my father, godly man, dignified man. He would look me straight into my eyes and say, Samuele, you stand up for what you know to be God's truth. God will honor your commitment. This is the challenge I like to pass on to all of us, that if we stand up for what we know to be God's truth, sometimes we may have to suffer ridicule, rejection, persecution, but ultimately the Lord will honor our commitment. Because of all of this problem, ridicule, rejection, persecution, I started dreaming. While I was still a teenager, 14, 15, 16 years old, I was dreaming already that one day, if the Lord would give me the opportunity, I said, I want to investigate which is God's holy day and what it should mean to our Christian life today. I felt that if I had to suffer, I wanted to suffer for the sake of biblical truth, not the denominational tradition. And my dream came true on July 1977, when I stood inside the Pontifical Gregorian University Press, watching my doctoral dissertation rolling off the Vatican Press with their official stamp. You see the papal tayar and the cross key and the official imprimatur. Folks, this is the only book that has ever been published by the Vatican, by Vatican Press, with their official stamp of approval given by two examiners, the rector of the university and the Archbishop of Rome. And let me hasten to say that this book has been a hot potato for the Roman Catholic Church. It has generated far more controversy in the dominant countries of Central and South America that you can imagine. I could show you a newspaper published in this country where they are really denouncing me, like this is from Puerto Rico, El Piloto. The whole center fold of the newspaper is a, what shall I say, it's a bitter attack against me. They are accusing me, attacking me uh, of being a wolf in sheep clothing, they say. They exclaim that I use deception to enter study, to have access to the archive and gathering all the material. They felt that all what I did 
was through deception, by hiding my identity. In other words, I was an Adventist infiltrator inside the Vatican. All of this is total nonsense, absolutely nonsense. They spent months and months and months to process my application because I was the first non-Catholic to apply and they didn't even know what to do with me. So it was a long process. But some of you, <laughs> some of you may be wondering, Dr. Bakioki, by the way, you are free to call me Brother Sam. Wherever I go, I tell people that Bakioki is too complicated to worry about. One thing I like about America, you always like to simplify things. So simplify my name and call me Brother Sam. Brother Sam, what made you decide to study at the Gregoriana? This is the entrance there to the university. After all, the Gregoriana is a leading Jesuit university, you know. It is the Alma Mater. It's the university that was founded by Ignatius of Loyola, the very founder of the Jesuit movement. It's the university that has been the Alma Mater of all the popes, cardinal, bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. Even this present pope is an alumnus you know, a, a graduate of the Gregoriana. Why did I go to study there? The answer is rather simple. I told you already that the Sabbath has been a testing truth in my life, that I was dreaming that the Lord may give me the chance someday to do an in-depth investigation of the Sabbath Sunday question. In fact, let me tell you something. As I went through the Adventist Academy in Florence, four years, Adventist College at Newburgh, four years, Adventist Seminary here at Andrews, four years, I must have prepared, written over 20 research projects dealing with theological, historical aspects of the Sabbath. This was a burning question in my heart because I had suffered a lot for Sabbath keeping. So I was hoping that if the Lord would open the door for me to study there, I may have access to the libraries, to the archive, and find documents, documents that shed, shed light on how the change came about from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. Now, my admission was problematic. Why? I was the first non-Catholic to be admitted. You know why? Until recently, they did not allow non-Catholics. It was only at the Second Vatican Council that was held in Rome from 1962 to 1965 that the provision was made for the separated brethren. Oh, I like that. I used to tease my classmates. I'm so happy. I'm not a heretic anymore. I'm a separated brother. And how can we be separated in Jesus Christ, you know? It was at Vatican II that the provision was made for the first time to allow the separated brethren to study in Pontifical University in Rome. There are five of them. I was the first one to take advantage of it. And the last one as well. You will, hear, you will learn about it in a moment. Why? And <laughs> <laughs> they interviewed me for two solid hours. They wanted to find out if perchance I was an Adventist spy entering there to do subversive activity. It's amazing that I have been uh, labeled as a spy both outside and inside the church. Even in, in the Adventist church, there are those who have been circulating. Even uh, last week, I got a 12-page um, publication where they are trying to construct a case against me, making me into a Jesuit spy paid by the Vatican to do subversive activity in the Adventist church. I wish that these people, before writing out all of this nonsense, would take time to talk to me or even to read what I have written. Then they would see that they are wasting their time because I'm a deeply committed servant the Adventist. I pay the high price throughout my life to stand up for the truth that we cherish. So all of these accusations, they are fabricated by people that have a conspiracy mentality, you know. Finally, they admitted me on one condition. What was it? They told me that while I was there in the classrooms, in the hallway, I should do no proselytism. I was supposed to keep my mouth shut, which is not easy for an Italian to do, by the way. <laughs> but you know what happened? I was there as a lay person. I was not wearing a monastic robe or a priestly robe. So I was an object of curiosity. They always asked me, to which religious order do you belong? Because all of them belong to various monastic orders. And jokingly, I would say, I belong to a special order, the Adventist order. And they would scratch their head, which monastic order is that? <laughs> that gave me a marvelous opportunity for me to share my faith. 
even in the classroom. You know what I remember? I remember my beloved professor, uh, Vincenzo Monachino, often at the end of his lecture would ask me the question, Samuel, how do you Adventists understand this particular you know, teaching or dogma that we were uh, studying in the class? And I was always very happy to give an answer because I was only supposed to speak if I was interrogated. Whenever he asked me a question, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I can speak. I remember the day. Careful now. I remember the day. We were, when we were discussing in the class the Vatican plan to anticipate the first Sunday Mass to Saturday afternoon, which has been implemented, by the way, everywhere around the world today, Catholic can fulfill what is known as the mass precept by going to church on Saturday afternoon. Are you aware of that? Everywhere you go today, Catholic who cannot make it to church on Sunday can go to church on Saturday afternoon, on Saturday evening, attend the Saturday mass, and that will be good enough for uh, fulfilling their Sunday uh, mass precept. And my professor asked, Samuel, how do you Adventists feel about it? You must be ecstatic about the fact that we Catholics are becoming more and more like you Adventists by observing the tail end of the Sabbath. So professor, thank you for asking. I could only speak if I was interrogated. Thank you for asking. But you know what? The Saturday afternoon mass may be good enough for Sunday keeping, but not for Sabbath keeping. Why? Because I said the essence of Sabbath keeping is not just going to church. The Sabbath commandment doesn't say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy by attending Sabbath school and divine service. It doesn't say that. that. The essence of Sabbath keeping is giving priority to God in our thinking and in our living. And for us as Seventh-day Adventists, all what we do on the Sabbath, whether we participate in a corporate worship experience or whether we enjoy formal fellowship, you know, visitation, recreation, all of it for us is an act of worship because it springs out of a heart who has decided to honor God on his holy day. Mamma mia, he should have seen my classmates and my professor. They were looking at me and said, do you mean to say that all the Adventists give priority to God on the Sabbath, consecrate their Sabbath time to God. Well, I said, I cannot speak for everybody. In every church, there are those who don't practice what they profess. But this is the way we understand the Sabbath. Isn't it true? Oh, what a pleasure it was to be there and share the faith among uh, so many 5,000 students coming from 91 different countries. Now, this leads me to the subject of my research. How did I become involved in this um, investigation of the origin of Sunday. One morning I got there early, 7 o'clock. Start, classes started at 9 o'clock. The only way to find a parking spot was to be there two hours before class. I tell you, you don't realize how privileged we are in a place like Andrew, that we can park the car without having to lose our mind, you know. And we only had a small parking lot. 450 cars, we were 5,000 coming from all over the city. And so, since I had some time on my hand, I went, I spent the time in the hallway looking at all the latest publications which had just been released by the university. And I saw a newly published dissertation. The title of the dissertation is Storia della Domenica, History of Sunday from the beginning to the fourth century. This is a very major dissertation style. I went to the bookstore, I purchased a copy right away, and for the next several months, I used every spare moment to examine this book. In fact, shall I tell you, the, tell you one thing? I was going to bring you my own personal copy, but it is so worn out that I thought it would be embarrassing to show it to you. So I went to the library to get a copy that looks a bit cleaner, as you can see. But I spent many months examining this book. And what I was surprised me is that this Jesuit scholar argues that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the authority of Christ, by the authority of the apostle, who he claims chose the first day of the week, Sunday, in order to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus by means of the Lord's Supper celebration. Now, this is a very popular view. I'm sure that you have heard this view before, that Sunday was uh, instituted, you know, originated as a memorial of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, um, this, however, I should explain, is not the historical 
traditional Catholic view. This is a new explanation. Historically, the Catholic Church has always claimed the responsibility for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. For example, Thomas Aquinas, who is regarded as the most influential, authoritative Catholic theologian. He is to the Catholic Church what Ellen White is to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Notice what he says. In the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the church. Do you remember reading in the older Catholic catechism where the question is asked, why do we observe Sunday rather than Saturday? What has been the historical answer? We observe Sunday rather than Saturday because the Roman Catholic Church, by virtue of their authority, has transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday. Have you heard that before? Well, that was the historical, traditional explanation. We, the Catholic Church, did it. Today, however, there is a new attempt to legitimize Sunday no longer as a Catholic ecclesiastical institution, but as a biblical institution. And this is why you need to come to listen to the fourth lecture, the Sabbath and the Crossfire, because in that lecture, I'm going to spend some time examining the famous pastoral letter of Pope John Paul II, Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where you will see how the Pope attempts to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath and promote Sunday no longer as a Catholic, but as a biblical institution. And this, in many ways, is the approach of Catholic and Protestant scholars and even of former Sabbatarian. When I discovered this trend, when I noticed how this trend of trying to legitimize Sunday as a biblical institution, as I read all of this dissertation, I spent over $1,000 ordering dissertation from Germany, from Spain, from Switzerland, from the United States. I ordered a dissertation by Francis Reagan, then at the Catholic University of America. For that dissertation alone, I paid $150 to have a photocopy, and they're mailed to me in Rome. As I read all of this research, and I noticed this, this concerted effort, this stretching of the hands across the gulf in their common endeavor to justify Sunday as a biblical institution, I ask myself, is it possible that the Lord has brought me here at such a time as this, you know, to undertake a research conducted with scientific rigor and methodology, a research that can help to clarify the time, the place, the causes, the consequences of the change of God's holy day. You know, folks, the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the deeper the conviction became within my heart that I should dare to approach my professor, Vincenzo Monachino, and ask him permission to undertake this research. I remember the day when I went to visit him in his room because they received us in their little bedroom, which was also their office, very Spartan setting with their bed, their library, their little altar to pray, and their little desk, and I remember at my professor, we had a special relationship. I was his right-hand man. I distributed all the syllabi, collected all the money, went up with him every day in his room. He, was, he came to love me as a son. And so I went to see, Professor, I have a question to ask you. Would you be willing to allow me to investigate the origin of Sunday observance for my doctoral dissertation without saying a word? He went to the shelf of his library, picked up a copy of the dissertation of Mosna, which he himself had directed, and he put it right under my nose. He said, we have just published a major study, and it's not the policy of the university to allow students to work in an area which has been amply investigated. Folks, I've been a literature evangelist for 12 summers <laughs> in Italy, in England, in the United States. Do you know what? I learned a lesson. You never take the first no for an answer, otherwise you never make a sale. Isn't it true? So I did not take the no for an answer. You know what I did? I opened my call porter briefcase. I pulled out all the books I've been reading, including the one of Mosna. So professor, I read Mosna, I read Rordoff, I read Daniel Lu, I read Massey, I read all of these guys. And my conviction is that the final word has not been spoken. And if you were so gracious to allow me to re-examine all the biblical and historical material, I believe that we can come much closer to the truth. Will you be willing to help me? When he noticed my conviction and my determination, he said, why don't you go down to the academy, academic dean's office, state your objective, I will recommend your proposal for approval. And this is exactly what he did. I really want to thank God 
for being able to work at the feet of such a noble scholar, a man with a very high intellectual stature, a man that was willing to encourage the inquiry into truth rather than to protect the prevailing Catholic position. He knew that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was one of the, the two uh, professors who interrogated me on the day of my admission. He knew that he was going to take a risk, but somehow God gave him the courage to take the risk. And I want to tell you that not all the professors were of the same mind. Some professors were really very what shall I say, hostile toward me. They did not see how in the world I would be allowed to be there. One of them told me one day. We were in Ravenna on a study tour with the Gregoriana. We were examining all of these ancient uh, sites. And I remember we were walking along the pavement of the street. And I told this professor, I was a bit naive perhaps, some of the discovery that I made. I shared with him some of the papal decretal, which I found you know, indicating how the papacy went about leading people away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. I should have never done it. He changed the color. He became blue. I could tell that I had touched a sensitive nerve. And you know what he told me? If I'm ever going to be in the examining commission, I'm going to give you hell, ti darò l'inferno, mamma mia. We don't believe in hell, do we? But one thing we know that those Jesuits are sharpshooters. And if they want to boycott the work of the students, they know how to do it. And the threat of hell was not a comforting thought. While I was preparing for the defense of my dissertation, my wife can tell you that sometimes at night, I had nightmares. I was twisting and turning. I was somehow, you know, having this nightmare of entering the defense hall and seeing this man, you know, really you know, attempting to, 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 to destroy the validity of my research. You know, and once you have spent five years, made a tremendous financial and, uh, and time investment, the thought of everything being blocked the last minute, you know, I didn't like to have to call President Hamill and tell him that I had to spend another year or two because uh, my dissertation had been rejected. So I want, to give thank, I want to thank God for being able to work at the feet of such a good man. I'm only sorry to tell you that this man has been suffering for me. He passed away about a year ago. I was in Rome. I was hoping to see him on his deathbed at the critical care unit at the hospital. They would not allow me. They would not allow me because the general of the Jesuit order gave clear directive that he should never have any contact with me. Why? Because he was blamed for all the problems, for all of this negative denunciation from Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Costa Rica, and so forth, and Puerto Rico. Many of these Catholic leaders were fuming for, for, for the university allowing me to enter, study, research, and publish what they consider to be detrimental to their faith. And obviously, my professor made it happen. And so he's the one that was severely reprimanded. Now, my strategy was to discuss with my professor any significant historical or, or biblical document. Whenever I found something that was provocative for the Sabbath, I would go and show it to my professor. Professor, look what I found. And he would always take time to read it. And he would always say, mm, this is something to think about. This is something to think about. My aim was to gain gradual approval. You follow me? I didn't want him to give a knockout at the end. That would have been counterproductive. You follow me? And so whenever I found something exciting, I went to show it to him. Let me share you an exciting experience. One day I was searching for documentation on the early history of the Jerusalem church because the prevailing scholarly assumption, as you are going to learn on Sunday morning uh, at, the, at the fifth and last presentation, is that the Jerusalem church pioneered the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. Why? Who could do it? Not a small, insignificant church. They claim only the apostolic authority residing in the Jerusalem church could accomplish such a change. So I went uh, to the library, to the Vatican archive, looking for documents shedding light on the early history of the Jerusalem church. And I found a very interesting account of the Jerusalem church by Epiphanius. He's a Palestinian historian who lived in the fourth century. 
and you know, he gives the account of the uh, Jerusalem church of how the direct descendant left the city prior to the AD 70 destruction, went up to Pella, uh, colonized the place, and he said that this direct descendant of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in the observance of the Sabbath until 350 AD. So when I went to show it to my professor, I remember the day when I went to see my professor with this document. By the way, when I found it, I jumped for joy. I asked the guy there at the Vatican, could you make a copy for me right away? You know the rule, you leave it with us today, you get a copy tomorrow. They, they are not in a hurry. They have been around 2,000 years. One day more, one day less. Doesn't make a scratch of difference to them. But when you are excited, you don't want to wait for 24 hours. So I gave him a little tip, a couple of thousand do- lira, you know, which is about a dollar. And I said, Fratello mio, my dear brother, please accept this as a token expression of gratitude for your immediate service. And like in the creation story, spoken, it came into existence. A minute later, I had the document hot out of the copy machine. I went to show it to my professor. Professor, look what I found. What did you find this time? Why don't you take a look at it? It's Greek and Latin. And he said, no, do a letter what? Where did you find it? It was right here in your Vatican archives. I did not bring it from America for sure. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> And you know what he said? Samuel, questo è il certificato di morte. This is the death certificate, the death blow to the theory that makes Jerusalem the birthplace of Sunday keeping. Why did he say that? Because he was a bright guy. I tell you, it's a pleasure to work with Jesuits. They are bright people. You don't have to explain very much. You know, during the 26 years of teaching here at Andrews, I wish that all my students had been Jesuit, so I would not have to repeat myself so many times. You know, with the Jesuit, they catch on right away. He got the point. What is the point that he got? That if the direct descendants of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in the observance of the Sabbath until the fourth century, then what? Then they could have hardly been responsible for changing the Sabbath to Sunday in the first place. Are you with me? When I was able to prove to the satisfaction of my professor that um, Jerusalem was to be excluded, then I began my research on the possible role of the Church of Rome. And I found a very important documentation, which I will share with you in the fifth lecture. Now, I found that this historical change from Sabbath to Sunday began during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian, who reigned from 117 to 138 as a result of three major factors. One was anti-Judaism that led to the abandonment of the Sabbath. The second was sun worship that influenced the adoption of Sunday. And the third was the various measures employed by various popes to lead people away from Sabbath keeping to Sunday keeping. Here, for example, I have the picture of Pope Sixtus, the one who introduced Easter Sunday and the weekly Sunday. Victor, the one who excommunicated the Asian Christian for refusing to accept the Easter Sunday, most likely the weekly Sunday celebration. Pope Sylvester, the one who made the Sabbath a day of fasting to kill the joy of the Sabbath. Pope Innocent I, the Pope that prohibited any assembly, any celebration of the Lord's Supper on Sabbath. Now, why were these measures taken? The main reason was the the repressive, anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath policy of the Roman government. This Roman emperor, Hadrian, uh, you can see this picture here on the cover of the Biblical Archaeology Review that published my article as a cover story some time ago. This Roman emperor, Hadrian, after fighting three years to suppress what is known as the Bar Kokhba revolt, from 132 to 135, he suffered many casualties. But when he finally captured Jerusalem, he said, this is it. Hitler said, let's liquidate the Jews. Hadrian said, let's liquidate Judaism as a religion. What did he do? He outlawed not only the Jewish religion in general, but seven days Sabbath keeping in particular. And I found it was in that critical moment when seven days Sabbath keeping was proscribed, forbidden, outlawed by Roman law, that many Christians of a Gentile background followed the lead of the Bishop of Rome in adopting Sunday observance instead of the Sabbath. So as you can see, the motive for changing the Sabbath to Sunday was expediency, was the desire to avoid a repressive, 
anti-Sabbath legislation. May I ask you, is expediency a legitimate motive for changing a divine commandment? Did you ever read in your Bible, if you find it difficult to observe one of my commandments, please don't suffer for it, just change it. Just change it. Have you ever read that in your Bible? But folks, this is exactly what has happened. Time and again in the history of Christianity, there have been church leaders who have chosen compromise rather commitment to the, to the teaching of the Word of God. Now, anti-Judaism explains the reason for the abandonment of the Sabbath, but the choice of Sunday, or the day of the sun, was influenced by sun worship that became very influ influential in ancient Rome. I found that there were two kinds of sun worship. One is the native one. Here you see Apollos with the sun burst, here with a chariot ascending to the sun. That was the Roman uh, god Apollos that was made into a sun god by the beginning of the second century. Then there was the foreign sun god Mithraism that became very popular. Mithras became very popular among the, among the, in the army, among the soldier, among the merchant, among the magistrate. And this syncretistic sun worship and this popularity of the sun god made the day of the sun the first and most important day of the week. It's a bit difficult to explain everything in a few seconds, but some of you might be able to catch what I'm trying to say. Originally, the seven-day week, which were the, all the days of the week were named after the planet and were shown according to the picture of the planetary god that controlled a particular day of the week. Originally, the day of the sun was the second day of the week. The first day of the week was Saturn. Dies Saturni was day number one. Dies Solis was day number two. That is in the first century. But as the sun god became the most important god, what did they do? They advanced the day of the sun from day number two to day number one. And I found that when the sun god became the first and most important day of the week for the Romans, obviously then Saturday became the seventh day for both the Roman and the Christian and the Jews. But when that development occurred, this advancement of the day of the sun to the first and most important position, I found that many Gentiles coming from a Gentile background felt that... Um, by adopting the day of the sun, the day which was venerated in the Roman society, they could show separation from the Jews, identification with the Romans. So the change from Sabbath to Sunday was not just a change of names or of numbers, but was a change of meaning, authority, and experience. It was a change from God's holy day to a man-made holiday. I'd like to close tonight by sharing with you the most dramatic moment of my experience, the day of my defense. The date was Friday afternoon, June 14, 1974. So many years have gone by. When is it? Almost 29 years. It's so fresh in my mind as if it was yesterday. I remember this Aula Magna, this grand hall with all of these gold leaves decorated, leaving all the Baroque furniture. There was a long examining table. Behind the table, there were five distinguished Jesuits scholar, all of them with a shining top like mine, and there was about 100 Adventists that came out that Friday afternoon to listen to an Adventist boy. I, I grew up among them, so they called me the Adventist boy defending the Sabbath truth before such a distinguished team of Vatican scholar. I was given one hour. I was sitting on the main floor behind a small desk. I was given one hour to give a summary of the methodology and conclusion of my research. And in that one hour, I explained not only what I found in their archives, but as I came to the end, I made a fervent appeal to rediscover the Sabbath in order to revitalize the quality of Christian living of millions of people throughout the world. I wish you would have been there. I guarantee to you it would have been an unforgettable experience to hear my professor, Vincenzo Monachino, the one who directed the dissertation of Mosnes, I was telling you a moment ago, and the one who directed my dissertation as well. In fact, he wrote the foreword. The he presented both dissertations. They forward to both di dissertations. And you know what he said? After spending two years with my previous students, Corrado Mosna, I thought we had established conclusively the apostolic origin of Sandy. But after spending two more years with San Bacchiochi, I have to confess to you today that I have changed my mind. I have come to realize that Sunday keeping is a post-apostolic phenomenon 
Oh, that was sweet music to my ear. To hear my professor that he had changed his mind. And, you know, if you know anything about the scholarly community, when a scholar develops a thesis, a view, he doesn't want to renegade it. They usually fight for it to the bitter end. And, you know, at the end he said, and now, after all what Sam has said and done about the Sabbath, there is one thing left for us to do. What's going to be? Is he going to excommunicate me now? No, it's the one thing left for us to do, and that is to wish to Sam a good, holy Sabbath day of rest. Mamma mia, I was ready to invite my professor to join with me in a special Sabbath celebration. A few days later, I learned that the Pope himself, Pope Paul VI, had awarded me a gold medal for earning the academic distinction of summa cum laude. Now, this is a very beautiful medal. I brought in here the original one. It's a nice piece of gold worth about $3,000. I think it's always nice to have a bit of gold for the rainy days, don't you think so? And uh, on the front side, there is a picture of the Pope. On the back side, you can see there's a shepherd, the lamb, the flock, and the new Jerusalem. It portrays the Pope as the great shepherd of the flock, leading God's people to the city of God. Fellow believers and friends, I view this gold medal not as a personal triumph, but as the triumph of truth, the triumph of our mission today to proclaim the good news of the Sabbath to our tension-filled and restless society. Now, many people are suspicious about me. They wonder how in the world could I get a gold medal from the Pope for producing a research which is defensive of the Sabbath. You know, the answer is rather simple. You know why? Because all what I did in my research was to prove that the historical Catholic position is absolutely correct. What have they claimed historically? To have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. All what I did was to find the document, the papal decretal, showing how they did it. You follow me? And from the viewpoint of my professor, even though the change should not have taken place, from another viewpoint, it really proves the authority of the Pope, not only to change the Sabbath to Sunday, but to introduce so many holy days in the Catholic calendar. That is part of the papal authority. And so basically, the reason why I received this, this award for the Summa Cum Laude is because I had, I had presented a very compelling documentation, argumentation showing how the papacy went about in changing the Sabbath to Sunday. Then I received a special diploma. You know why? I refused to accept the first diploma. When I looked at the first diploma, which, which was a small piece of paper, in the opening statement, I saw it read that I had signed the Catholic profession of faith, which was not true. I received a special dispensation. They exempted me from signing the Catholic creed and from attending the religious exercise. But when I looked at the diploma, it says, Samuele Bacchiocchi, subscription, profession of the Catholic. I said, I thought, this cannot be my diploma. I have never signed the Catholic creed. The diploma is the same for everybody. We have only inserted your name. That cannot be the same for me. If I go back to America and hang my diploma, what will people think? Don't worry about it. The diploma is in Latin. The Americans don't understand <laughs> Latin. Why make any show about it? No, I said, I'm not prepared to compromise. So they gave the assignment to a Vatican scribe to prepare this beautiful diploma. It's much nicer than the one of Andrews University. Isn't it true? This is in parchment. And it is all written by hand, decorated by hand, given in the name and the authority of Pope Paul VI and signed by a number of distinguished Vatican authority. And folks, let me tell you, when I, this is all, let, let, let me hold a second. When I received the diploma and the special gold coin, I was reminded of my father's words. When my father used to tell me, stand up for what you know to be right, God's truth, God will honor your commitment. I also received a special academic regalia. Some of you may have seen me wearing it a few times. I think I wore it four times in 26 years of teaching at Andrews. I don't like to wear the outfit. I feel very uncomfortable because I look like a bishop. If you have never seen <laughs> what an Adventist bishop looks like, this is a picture of her. <laughs> Well, because of all the negative reaction to the research that I did, the Pontifical Gregorian University took three steps. Number one, they confiscated my book from Sabbath to Sunday. I could smell smoke. I could tell that it was coming. So I went to Rome, negotiated, buying the copyright. I paid $5,000 to compensate them for all the investment they had made in typesetting and publishing 
uh, my dissertation. I'm glad that I did it. I would not be able to reprint it at this time. Today, all the Catholic institutions, like Notre Dame University, they order every year 25 copies for their, early, uh, for their class in early Christian liturgy. All the Catholic universities have to order the book from me because the Vatican tells them that it's no longer available. My professor was told never to have any contact with me. That was the directive of the general of the Jesuit order, and the door of the university was closed. I was the first and the last one non-Catholic to be admitted. When I was in Rome last, last summer, the pastor there said, Samuel, you spoiled it for everybody. Nobody can enter there anymore. Well, in closing, I want to express my gratitude to God for two reasons. Number one, for his providential leading in my life. We all have a story to tell of God's leading. I would love to hear your story because I'm sure that many of you have a story of how the Lord has led you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I also want to thank God for leading me to a fuller understanding of the Sabbath. When I entered the Vatican, I thought of the Sabbath as being primarily a commandment, an obligation, something we have to observe in order to be saved. But while I was there, Examining those ancient documents, I became aware that for God's people in ancient time, the Sabbath was not an alienating imposition, but was a divine invitation extended to us each week to make ourselves free and available for God. And this is my fervent hope and prayer for each one of us tonight, that the Sabbath may become for us our loving response to our Savior invitation, extended to us each week to come to Him and find rest in Him. May the Sabbath become the day when we experience in a special way the presence, the peace, and the rest of God in our lives. This is my prayer for each one of us tonight. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of the Sabbath, the day that invites us to draw closer to thee and closer to one another. May we on and through thy Sabbath day experience in a special way thy presence, thy peace and thy rest in our lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.